Thank everybody. Uh, and thanks for coming along tonight to this joint event featuring Associate Professor Ben Wellings from Monash University in Melbourne. Tonight's event is hosted jointly by the politics program here at the University of Otago and the New Zealand Institute of International Affairs. My name is Geoffrey Miller. I'm working with a number of others uh, to run some uh, ad hoc NZIA events here in Dunedin with the ultimate aim of re-establishing a branch in the city because there currently is no uh, NZIA branch in Dunedin. A little bit about the NZIA uh, before we uh, introduce our speaker tonight. Uh, the New Zealand Institute of International Affairs is an independent non-governmental organisation that fosters expert discussion and understanding of international issues and emerging trends, particularly as they relate to Aotearoa New Zealand. Established in 1934, the Institute encourages understanding of international issues so that New Zealanders are better informed, gain different perspectives and have greater connections to the outside world. It exists for the long-term political, social, economic and environmental well-being of New Zealand. Membership of the New Zealand Institute of International Affairs is open to all and is free, in fact, for students. So there's no reason not to join. And for more information about the NZIA, simply go along uh, to the website, which you can see on the screen here, nziaa.org.nz. Currently, as I said, there is no formal branch established in Dunedin. So if you're looking at joining, just choose the national office option. And that can be changed later on if uh, we do get a branch up and running. I'll now pass you on to Associate Professor Jim Headley from the Politics Program to introduce our speaker in more detail. Thanks, Jeffrey. Um, kia ora koutou. Um, it's really good actually to hear the NZIA being rebooted here. When I first came down here, it was operational, although we had smaller audiences, much smaller audiences than this. So it's good. This is good, you know, seeing people coming back um, and a good range of audience as well, actually. Which, um, so it's really good to sort of see us back in the national network, actually. And uh, thanks to all the work that um, Jeffrey and uh, Keena and Jamie and others last year actually have put into this. But anyway, on to uh, welcoming uh, Associate Professor Ben Wellings. So uh, we were discussing that uh, we had actually probably met for the first time at a conference here, which I organised in 2008. So we've known each other for a long time, uh, met each other at conferences abroad, including most recently in Glasgow in June. Uh, and uh, part of our kind of um, interaction there is uh, a common interest in nationalism and integration and disintegration. And Ben very kindly spoke to my uh, course on nationalism and identity this morning, uh, exactly about uh, nationalism and European disintegration. Uh, so Ben's published widely on nationalism, uh, on English nationalism, on European integration and disintegration, and on the Anglosphere and most lately uh, in the conversation yesterday about Australia and football and the Matildas who turned out not to be what they were hyped up to be, I think. <laughs> now you can have a look Have a look at this article, it's very good, about um, bringing in kind of ideas about identity and what it means for uh, uh, women in football and sport in Australia and also the English-Australian sport rivalry. Uh, today, he's going to be uh, speaking uh, about the strange life and death of global Britain uh, New Zealand EU UK relations in the AUKUS era and just to emphasize that sort of EU element um, just thanks also to Dr Serena Kelly who's over there taking photos at the moment uh, who has basically funded Ben's trip as part of a research project funded by the European Union which I think Ben's got a logo about on his slides so thanks to Serena for uh, funding all of this and uh, for bringing us all together and uh, nice to see you and your colleagues here as well. Okay, so I'll hand over to Ben. Uh, and yeah. We're recording on Zoom mainly as a request from British High Commission apparently, but uh, we may well put it on the NZIA uh, website. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay at the back? Is that all right? Great. Thank you very much. Uh, now, um, and hello to the people of the British High Commission. I have to stand between the two, uh, these two things here for uh, best effect. Um, 
And uh, so th there's lots of thank yous before I get going. Of course, uh, I would like to thank the University of Otago uh, uh, for hosting me and for the um, to, to Serena and people at University of Canterbury for um, uh, for funding me to come to come over here. And if we were in Australia, I would start with an acknowledgement of country. And I don't know what the protocols are here, but I would just like to acknowledge the uh, elders and custodians uh, of the land on which we are meeting. So um, my remit, of course, is, yes, that's up there, that's good. So my, my remit, of course, um, is, is part of a bigger uh, range of speakers who uh, Serena's team are bringing out to, um, uh, to uh, New Zealand uh, and, and at times collaborating with the New Zealand Institute of International Affairs. And the talk is about um, New Zealand, uh, EU relations in the region, uh, more broadly, or the theme, I should say. Uh, my remit was a little bit different. Um, Serena asked if I could talk about British foreign policy and what that might mean, or I should say post-Brexit British foreign policy, and what kind of implications that might have in the region. So, of course, we know that the United Kingdom left the European Union in January 2020, but, um, you know, we have lived in interesting times since then, particularly with the pandemic, but also AUKUS announced in September 2021 um, in May this year, we got the announcement of the uh, where actually the submarines for Australia's nuclear submarine fleet would uh, be coming from over the next 15 years or so. Uh, and we've had free trade agreements or not, depending on uh, the country and, and who's involved. So basically, there's been a lot going on. But Jim mentioned that uh, he and I met most recently at a, a conference in Glasgow in, in Scotland, the British International Studies Association uh, conference over there. And there was a lot of talk about global Britain, but in the past tense, right? Because it, it was noticeable that the term which had emerged, I'll go into this in more detail, but it had emerged during, um, uh, very, well, very soon after the Brexit vote in 2016 was no longer appearing on government documents or government speeches. So it might actually be the moment to um, uh, talk about this in the past tense and draw uh, a kind of parentheses around this. But as I'll say, global Britain is part of a longer tradition. There is a longer lineage in terms of British foreign policy thought, which I think this is only the most recent manifestation of. So let's see. There we go. All right. So let me uh, say, explain what I'll, I'll talk about over the next um, 40 minutes or so. Um, I'll, I'll introduce some explanatory frameworks, and that, that, that is the so-called traditions and dilemmas approach in British uh, or UK foreign policy. And then the section on global Britain itself is structured around three questions, what, when and why. So what was global Britain? More importantly, when was global Britain? And then why? Why did that come about? Why is that a particular uh, policy response that uh, emerged and um, uh, has been dropped a little bit from the uh, political rhetoric? Uh, what I then want to do, and I'm going to have to move away a little bit from um, from the well, it's all, all, this is all part of it. I'll be moving away a little bit from uh, where this sits with New Zealand and. Um, uh, and the European Union, but it's definitely in there, is a, a little bit of perceptions research that myself and colleagues have done, particularly uh, Richard Hayton at Leeds, but also Jack Holland, also at Leeds and Eglantine Staunton at the ANU, uh, on perceptions of the Anglosphere, Global Britain and AUKUS. Right, so we've been interviewing, uh, and this owes a lot to the techniques that Serena uses for her perceptions projects, uh, of which I was part back in 2016. Um, we basically have interviewed policy making elites and opinion formers and asked them, what do you know about something called the Anglosphere? What do you think about global Britain and the free trade agreements that, that global Britain was um, uh, associated with? Uh, and uh, anything you can tell us about AUKUS, All right? So uh, then once I've gone through and presented that, the findings of that research, which haven't been written up yet, but we're in the process of doing that, I'll say a little bit about Labour's foreign policy, because the Labour Party is currently in opposition. There'll be an election probably next year in the UK, possibly very early 2025. 
So it's probably worth casting ahead a little bit and thinking about what Labour's foreign policy would be, and then talk about what are the implications for this region. All right, so um, then I'll conclude and then we can open up for questions uh, from the floor. So the framework that I use to analyze Britain's uh, British foreign policy is the so-called tradition and traditions and dilemmas approach. Now, this is an approach that um, developed about 15 years ago, really to try and explain public policy uh, in the United Kingdom. But then more recently, uh, about 10 years ago or so, uh, there was a journal, uh, a special issue of the Journal of um, Common Market Studies, so the premier journal for the study of uh, European integration, which focused, this was one year before uh, Brexit, on traditions and dilemmas in British foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis European integration. Right? Um, and this approach is sort of quite a fruitful way of understanding or helping to understand decisions that foreign policy actors make. So we're trying to infer from uh, actions and words uh, what's the kind of causal, you know, wh wh why are people making the choices that they are, right? And this is particularly associated with the work of um, initially Mark Bevere and Rod Rhodes, but in terms of the British foreign policy approach, Mark Bevere, uh, Oliver Daddo and Ian Hall, um, and they make a fairly, a fairly simple claim which they flesh out, which is that an actor's conceptualization of an issue will be framed by political traditions. Okay, so what, what they're saying is that when policymakers decide to do something, they're not making this um, de novo, it's not a tabula rasa and they're just presented with information and then they make choices. Uh, they'll say their thinking has been conditioned by the political traditions within which they operate. Now, uh, a tradition isn't necessarily an ideology, but it is, runs pretty close so that you might imagine that a Labour politician would be influenced by Labour political traditions, a Conservative by Conservative political traditions. And some of those are specific to the countries that they're in and others are more, uh, more, more generic. You know, the place of Edmund Burke in conservatism you know, could be found in lots of English speaking countries, um, but has particular resonances, say, in the United Kingdom. Um, so. Bevere, Dado, and Hall argue that a tradition captures this is historical inheritance against the background of which individuals act. Right now, but that doesn't mean to say that it's completely deterministic. That uh, you know, someone who is a conservative will always make decisions consistent with conservative thinking, or or or, or so on. Um, but it it does put them in in a place of situated agency. So they're kind of concerned with the the, the agency structure debate. And you know why do we why you know how how much autonomy do we have you know more or less than we actually think, um, or are we kind of trapped if you like in in structures that make us behave in in ways that that even we may not be fully cognizant of, but they don't they don't say this is deterministic they they just say this is the starting point right um, it's unavoidable only as a starting point it doesn't necessarily determine later performance so. Individuals can deviate from this if for whatever reason they think that is the right thing to do. But that's basically what we mean by the traditions and dilemmas approach. And uh, you'll see where that starts to uh, pop up um, in a moment. Other influential writers that um, uh, also were influential for me, they are very influential in their own right, but influential in my thinking about uh, this uh, particularly when it comes to questions about the Anglosphere, Surgeon Buchetich, Jack Holland, Michael Kenny, and Nick Pierce. And they, in, in their slightly different ways, but I'm going to kind of group their, their argument together, basically that policy follows identity. Right? So they're actually making sort of quite an important claim that uh, if you can determine uh, or if you can just understand what actors think they're the identity of their identity or the uh, their identity of the state in which they uh, on whose behalf they act is, you should be able to basically understand uh, foreign policy actions and foreign policy uh, outcomes. So let's start off with uh, two of the first three questions: Global Britain, what? and when are actually closely related, right? I've, I've said that, that we might be sort of talking about global Britain in the past tense. So I wanted to kind of float the idea of when we first heard the term global Britain, and this goes back to uh, the immediate post-Brexit referendum days. Uh, Theresa May has formed government. 
the British position leading up to triggering Article 50 of the Treaty uh, on European uh, Union is, uh, is taking place. And in January 2017, Theresa May outlines her vision for the United Kingdom outside of the European Union. And this is where the tagline, a global Britain, comes in. And what she says is, is, is this, I want us to be a truly global Britain, the best friend and neighbour to our European partners, but a country that reaches beyond the borders of Europe too. A country that gets out into the world to build relationships with old friends and new allies alike. So there's quite a lot being carried in that short sentence. First of all, the notion that when Britain was in the European Union, it wasn't global. Um, it was. Uh, the European Union was also global, particularly in its trading, uh, trading aspects. But trade became one of those elements about which conservative Brexiteers got very focused on. And this, of course, goes back to free trade traditions in British conservatism, uh, and which we know has been particularly difficult for British conservatism at key moments in the 1840s, uh, and then with imperial preference uh, in the 18, uh, 1890s. Um, but so, first of all, you see that that um, Britain is is it's, it's a global, it's capital G and capital B. Uh, and I think this was not intentional, but you notice it's not the global United Kingdom. And when we think about like the troubles that there were over Northern Ireland, where for a long time Great Britain had left the Un European Union, but the United Kingdom had not entirely left the European Union. So that there's sort of like something uh, in that construction there. Um, and a country that gets out into the world, that builds relationships with old friends and new allies alike. And it's this bit about old friends that also starts to speak about relationships with the United States, with Canada, but especially with Australia and New Zealand. And Australia and New Zealand assume uh, a kind of disproportionate significance as Britain starts to leave the European Union. And I'm going to come to that a little bit uh, later on. So we, we think here we've got something from 2017. We, we know it pops up in policy documents, particularly the uh, integrated uh, review, um, uh, or at least the first one from 2021, which was called Global Britain in a Competitive Age. And this was the government's white paper on uh, foreign and security policy. And it was it did the kind of things that um, surprised some people, like inserted the United Kingdom back as a, or tried to, back as a player in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, and then we saw a British carrier ship uh, make a sort of symbolic patrol in, in, the, in the region. And the idea that British foreign policy would be pushed sort of beyond uh, Eden, the, the, the idea of like, um, uh, sorry, Eden, Aden, um, uh, th that idea that, uh, that that British uh, foreign policy, which had not been constructed in that way since the 1960s, was now in a more uh, expansive phase, Afghanistan notwithstanding. So then why global Britain? So why did we get this? And that's that's a little bit where the genealogy of this idea uh, comes in, and we need to trace global Britain back. And the first step that we go back, because we can go back several steps, but the first step we go back takes us to something called the Anglosphere. And what we've got here is a strand of thinking within the Conservative Party, particularly the right wing of the Conservative Party, which, as uh, Johnson's relationship to this is is, is slightly slightly unusual, but he's, he's the best one to illustrate it in terms of public perceptions, is basically that the kind of uh, the idea that you sometimes heard in, in New Zealand and a little bit in Australia as well, that in 1973, Britain had betrayed Australia and New Zealand. Um, I've been stuck in a lift with someone who was telling me about that one time. So I kind of, that really stuck with me. Um, it was my fault, apparently. So, um, but here we start to see the right wing of the Conservative Party, if I said embrace is the wrong term, re-embracing the idea that had never really gone away, but had gone into us kind of like an important abeyance during the 70s, 80s and 90s, that actually Britain ought to be trading with its old allies, that is to say, members of the Commonwealth with the United States as a kind of um, the, the special relationship as a discrete part of that. 
So Johnson starts writing this. This is when he's still mayor of London in his kind of liberal phase. Um, he starts writing this in 2013 because he keeps coming to Australia. He loves Australia. In 2014, Tony Abbott made him the honorary Australian of the year for his services to Australians in London. And uh, Johnson claims to have been a professor of European politics at Monash University in 1992. Now we all know Johnson has kind of this particular relationship with the truth. So we did a little bit of, we did a little bit of digging into that. Um, I was contacted by a, 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 um, a journalist from the Atlantic who picked up on this story because Johnson had told some people uh, at a school or something in, in Britain like one time, yeah, I used to be a professor in, in Australia. So we checked. What happened is that he'd been given a two-week visiting fellowship by the Monash European Union Centre before it was, yeah, uh, and because he was a journalist. At the time, he was a journalist, and they wanted to get journalists out. But in his mind, that became uh, a professor of uh, European politics. So there we are. But um, importantly, of course, it's very easy to dismiss these ideas, but they won out, so they're, they're serious. Um, this was a policy outcome of this political tradition readopted, I should say readopted at a time of political uncertainty. So one thing we've got to remember, go back to the traditions and dilemmas, is imagine if you're in a very pressured situation, you kind of don't know what the future holds. What do you do? You fall back on what you know. And there's also a kind of the, the, the churn around who's going to be in the cabinet and you know the kind of difficulties that Theresa May was facing and so on. Uh, the British cabinet fell back on the idea of global Britain because you had to sell the uncertain future to people who had not voted for um, Brexit, but also to people who voted for Brexit. So some people wanted the uncertainty, a kind of creative uncertainty. And I think that the idea, this was never, I, I should say that no one ever really talks about the Anglosphere as such. It, it's very um, common if you go into sort of right wing um, think tanks, uh, look at the spectator, um, it's a sort of a pet project there, but in government no one really calls it by that name. So instead we get this uh, idea of global Britain which looks a lot like uh, the Anglosphere. So this is that was sort of part of the reason why myself and Richard Hayton at Leeds were, were keen to try and understand, um, keen to try and understand what policy makers thought about this thing called the Anglosphere. And that naturally then led us to ask them the same questions about global Britain itself, um, uh, and also um, then about AUKUS as our research uh, developed. So we got some good interviews. We got 25 interviews, both in the UK and, and, and Australia. Uh, and uh, so I'd be very interested to hear how this resonates with your understandings of Australia's thoughts on the Anglosphere or the UK or so on and so forth and that uh, we might have a discussion about that at the end. Um, to, to go back a little bit further, antecedents. Uh, Winston Churchill wrote a history of the English speaking peoples in the 1950s um, and this was an important antecedent of the Anglosphere that, that for him the English speaking peoples were a kind of cultural community or you know with, with their own independent sovereign states but nevertheless you know forged through the war um, a, a strong sense of uh, connection and of course his mother was American uh, he had very strong connections with the United States and so for him the English speaking peoples was a, a, a valid entity and one that was um, you know an actor in in history and international relations so he's kind of like the one of the uh, poster children of uh, of this movement. You'll notice that this one doesn't have the United States in. There is something else called Kanzuk, which is um, a, a movement for, that people want free movement between Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom. Again, sort of in that right-wing think tank space that um, the, the best illustration of the importance of that think tank space was Liz Truss when she became prime minister briefly. She was very much airing things that were part of that think tank uh, environment and ecosystem. Anyway. To get here, this is a former government advisor, uh, senior, um, and uh, this kind of sums up nicely this quote about 
perceptions of the Anglosphere. He says, the honest answer is no one would write down in the Foreign Office, we should do this with them because it's part of the Anglosphere. So in that sense, what people say and do about the Anglosphere, all the, the kind of ideologues who write about this, uh, is post facto justification for things that have already happened. But he said, and this is important, it's not irrelevant. And the fact of shared histories is not irrelevant. And it reveals something about a common identity and a trust, sort of fraternity, if you like, which in a written or unwritten ways definitely impacts who we see as our friends in the world and who we want to work with on things. So again, sort of think, think about something like Anzac in, in that kind of context and, and the kind of decisions that were made vis-a-vis -vis France and, um, and so on, and it starts to take on uh, important resonance. And um, I may have my slides in slightly wrong order here. I'll just... I may, be, I may seem to be missing my Australia perceptions of um, in Australia. The point I would have made about the perceptions of the Anglosphere in Australia would be that they're a very heavily associated with Tony Abbott and that right wing of the Liberal Party, uh, and b uh, are often kind of um, seen as a, just a a way to think about the importance of Britain in for Australian Conservatives and British institutions and symbols and so on. So um, then we started asking our interviewees questions about perceptions of global Britain and the foreign um, uh, trade agreement. Because one of the things, of course, that was really interesting at the time of Brexit was that uh, the UK as part of the EU was already under uh, in negotiations, <clears throat> excuse me, with both Australia and New Zealand for a free trade agreement. And then, when the uh, when the United Kingdom came out, it very quickly announced that it wanted free trade agreements with Australia, New Zealand, and the United States. <coughs> so, what happened uh, then is that the free trade agreements with um, the UK and New Zealand were signed very very quickly. Would anyone? Would you be able to go and get me um, a thing of water, and I'll pay you back. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I'll press on. Hang on. <coughs> so I think that the key thing to remember. <clears throat> I'll better stop. <laughs> Yeah, right. It's like an intermission. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you for that. 
<clears throat> All right. Well, uh, I hope you enjoyed your intermission and you got your uh, your ice cream and everything. So the point here, which was the bit of the kind of intellectual puzzle about this, was why did these free trade agreements with the UK take, you know, take so little time? And yet the ones with the European Union took 10 years or in the case of Australia have sort of stalled. Right. So we don't you know, in Australia, we still don't have that free trade uh, agreement. It's got stuck as ever on agriculture, but things that you would know about here as well, the geographic indicators and all that kind of stuff that can you call feta, feta and so on. So so then thinking about this in terms of, you know, the, the, the previous comment uh, quote from from that former government advisor, that the, the, the kind of there's some sort of trust that's hard to put your finger on, but it matters um, was about about the speed of this, but there were political explanations for this as well. And it's basically that um, Britain need to look like it was doing something. And that something was uh, trade agreements with uh, the UK, uh, sorry, with New Zealand and uh, Australia. And this is partly, of course, is because both those countries are in the, always difficult to say, CPTPP. And Britain, with its more global self perception wants to be in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And of course, we're taking a sort of purely regional view. We'd say, well, why, you know, they're not in there, but the, the British uh, government conceives of itself as uh, kind of a global player, you know, that, that geography doesn't really matter. And um, uh, uh, this actually goes slightly counter to, to what we know so far about trade agreements that they are sort of still quite regionally focused. But nonetheless, that's the idea. There's a political reason um, that uh, Britain needs um, an early um, a set of early goals. So when we get into the perceptions of global Britain and the free trade agreement in Australia, um, this came through really, really strongly, was that basically Britain was kind of desperate and needed something to uh, show to voters that they had you know, replaced their free trade agreement with the, the EU and wasn't simply rolling these things uh, over. Now, um, there was a, a trade agreement with the European Union itself. There was one with Japan, uh, which is also already being negotiated when Br Britain left the EU. But the uh, Australia and New Zealand ones were the completely uh, novel ones. Um, but this quote here sort of suggests, well, you know, came along very quickly. There must be political reasons for that. So that was a fairly settled view. Um, I should say that the, the views of the Anglosphere were also kind of fairly settled along those lines that... Um, uh, yes, it matters. We don't really know. We can't really explain why or show you much evidence, but it but it's important. Where things start to diverge a little bit was perceptions of AUKUS. Uh, and this is where we got like lots of different explanations, particularly for how it came about, right? Because um, there was this sense um, that, again, sort of this, this idea that external factors are pushing uh, these three countries together. But from, from a French perspective, you could sort of say, well, that's fine, but why isn't France in this? And there are all sorts of puzzles around, you know, France originally said you could have a nuclear submarine, um, but then we can retro we can take the nuclear stuff out, you can have a conventional submarine. The Australians said we don't want a conventional submarine. French said, well, we're give gonna give you a convention, we're gonna give you a nuclear one in the first place. We could have done that. And so it's kind of like this question, well, what is it about the French that sort of led to this? Well, it's not about the French, is it? What, what is it about perceptions of France that led to this particular outcome? And so some of this was just explained by sort of classic international relations. There's a strategic threat. These three people, um, uh, these three uh, countries um, share common values uh, and therefore uh, why shouldn't they act together? But there's, there's something that more that needs to be explained there. And sometimes when we spoke to, um, uh, particularly in, uh, in Australia, uh, former diplomats really kind of stress the agency of individuals. So di diplomats, of course, you know, need, need to believe, and I think they're right, but they also need to believe that their actions matter. I read this great chapter in a, in a book last year called Why Diplomats Hate International Relations Theory. And it was basically just saying that all international relations theory says it's kind of like structural and, you know, you, uh, the individual doesn't matter. We're back to our sort of situated agency and that kind of thing as well. And uh, 
So when, when you spoke to those people, they basically said orcas came about because somehow Johnson, Morrison and Biden got together at the Carbis Bay G7 meeting in June beforehand. And Johnson spotted an opportunity. Uh, and uh, Morrison, uh, as always, you know, wants Australia to be at the big table. Uh, and this was the way to get out of the contract with the French. And in the context of increasing Anglo-French rivalry in post-Brexit Europe, this was also a way to snub the French government. So uh, as a result, Australia has nuclear submarines uh, into the 2040s. So, you know, like, so, so that's an explanation that, that puts a lot of stress on individual agency, whereas the previous quote sort of suggests, well, there's just a kind of a strategic competitor, things have changed. Uh, the US is not as hegemonic as it, as it used to be. And so it needs to do something to turn things around a little bit. So it, last uh, penultimate uh, uh, substantive slide uh, here. So, th so that in, in a way suggests that, that we got to the stage where global Britain was associated much more with a kind of a, a, a much more um, bombastic Johnsonian kind of concept of Britain's place uh, in the world. And then we go through that political turmoil in the United Kingdom uh, last year. Johnson is forced out. Um, there's a very long leadership contest over the, the northern summer. Um, Trust gets in, you know, within 40 uh, odd days, she's out. Uh, and, um, and then Sunak comes in. And it's the, the integrated review refresh in, in the context of uh, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which drops that notion of global Britain. Right? So, so part of the explanation there is some of our uh, interviewees said it's just too associated with Boris Johnson and Theresa May. And what the Conservative Party was looking for under Sunak, so after Johnson and Truss, was a lot more measured language, appearance of stability, and so on and so forth. Why it's worth considering what the Labour Party are saying about um, uh, Britain's role in the world is, of course, because that the combination of the Johnson's party gate, uh, you know, his breaking of the rules uh, of the law in uh, during lockdowns and then the trust episode. Interesting, when I was in, in Britain in July, no one really knows what to call trust. It's, it's kind of like an event or a moment or an episode, and there's no settled consensus on what to actually call it. But uh, the Conservative government uh, has dropped in the polls vis-a-vis -vis Keir Starmer's uh, Labour Party, which if you go back to, to early 2020, when Keir Starmer was taking over from Jeremy Corbyn, and, and you'd suggested then that, that Labour might be in a position to form government five years later, would have been a very, very challenging proposition. But here we are now, um, where uh, and we can perhaps go into like the, the, the prospects uh, for this uh, uh, later on. But it's not impossible that, that Labour could be part of the next uh, government of the United Kingdom. So they haven't... Uh, as all good oppositions will try and keep a small target for as, uh, for as long as possible. Uh, they haven't said too much, but David Lammy, who is the shadow uh, uh, foreign secretary, has um, made a speech to the, the Fabian Society and uh, written uh, a little bit about this. And as you see that we've switched from global Britain to Britain reconnected. And the, this, of course, is a dig at the, the idea that, that Britain had disconnected. You know, global Britain had somehow disconnected from uh, its important strategic uh, friends and, and allies in uh, in Europe and was somewhat adrift. So um, the uh, the priorities uh, outlined in this document, security, prosperity, climate development uh, and diplomacy, because the relations between the Conservative government uh, and the Foreign Office have been uh, frosty. Uh, and during that Brexit period have undergone period of turbulence. I think that uh, some senior figures, and um, uh, if you if you read, you know, the Spectator, um, uh, you can find criticisms of the Foreign Common uh, and Development uh, Commonwealth and Development uh, Office for being kind of too pro EU, to being a break on um, uh, the government's visions for um, uh, global Britain and the domestic version of this. You know, more broadly, there's a criticism of um, the civil service. Uh, for being part of what gets called the blob, which is um, the sort of this political cultural mass which um, slows down conservatives, right? 
includes the civil service, teachers, uh, universities. I'm surprised to learn. Um, and so uh, having said this, of course, uh, in some senses, that's a, a, a product differentiation between the Labour Party uh, and the Conservative Party. Um, but the um, criticism is there of, of global Britain because it's, it's gone, it's been replaced by something. The Indo-Pacific tilt is seen as too bombastic and, an, and a, an instance of overreach. But Orcas is um, not going anywhere in the Labour Party's uh, view of the United Kingdom. This is partly because, of course, the submarines, the Orcas submarines are being built in the north of England, uh, and uh, that is a significant uh, source of domestic jobs, um, but also connects, um, uh, you know, keeps those uh, people in work until 2035. So, oops, on to the um, implications for this, uh, this part of the world. And um, I think that things have got easier since since uh, Johnson and Truss. I mean, Truss, in, in her short period in office, did manage to insult the French quite a lot and suggest that maybe they weren't necessarily uh, allies. Um, but of course, we've seen uh, uh, around uh, what's called the Windsor framework, uh, an actual resolution to um, the difficult problem of Northern Ireland from the, um, the United Kingdom's withdrawal from the European Union. And um, this kind of then coincides with the so-called Geostrategic uh, Commission under Ursula von der Leyen. And uh, I think that, that, again, Ukraine has helped uh, draw um, this Sunak government a little bit closer to, um, to the, the European Union. So the mood music there is, is certainly... Uh, better. Now we know that um, uh, the the EU's free trade agreement with um, uh, with New Zealand has been signed but not ratified. As I mentioned, things have stalled in uh, the EU Australia FTA, and that's even under a, a Labour government because in Australia we switched from a, um, a Liberal National Coalition government to a to a centre left Labour government. Um, but even there, things have, have, have got uh, a little bit stuck. And, uh, of course, we know that um, the, the UK uh, agreement, the trade agreement, came into force earlier this year with Australia. Um, early days, we have to see how that's going. Uh, but, of course, we know that the perception uh, amongst policy elites anyway is that Australia got a very good deal uh, out of that for political reasons. Last thing to say then would be, AUKUS and relations uh, with France. And I suspect that's the bit that we still need to know. Um, President Macron has been in the South Pacific fairly recently, celebrating New Caledonia's continuing um, uh, connection to, to France. And uh, France is a much more significant security partner in, uh, in the region than the United Kingdom, certainly until uh, uh, AUKUS. So um, it'll be interesting to see what happens uh, there. That was just my my pictures. I beg your pardon. I've just my my extra pictures of of free trade agreements and um, general happiness breaking out in the region. So um, so my conclusion then is okay. So global Britain may have been dropped from official government documents and speeches, um, but you know a little bit of Shakespeare, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet, uh, because it's part of this tradition, a particular tradition or a way of seeing Britain's place in the world that is very strongly. Um, embedded in the right wing of the Conservative Party, and um, and I suspect in the more centrist uh, parts of the Conservative Party, you know the, the European option is is off the table. So it's just a question of like what kind of recalibrations you make uh, with Europe. Um, Global Britain itself. I'm not talking about the the antecedents. I'm talking about the thing from Theresa May's uh, speech in in early 2017 up until the Integrated Review too, was a, a product of a specific historical moment, that is to say Brexit, but it had significant historical lineages in conservative political traditions. So when you understand the political traditions, it starts to make more sense. It doesn't seem quite as um, a, a wrench into a, a whole new uh, way of uh, being in the world that perhaps uh, it felt for a lot of people in the United Kingdom. Um, and these 
traditions then formed the starting point for the UK's post-EU policy uh, reorientation. So when we um, ask people about uh, you know, the, these kind of traditions, perceptions of the Anglosphere, Global Britain, uh, AUKUS, uh, in the UK and Australia, uh, what was coming through strongly was that these actors feel that these are, are particularly the Anglosphere is something that is important, that sense of commonality matters, but they can't point to any policy document that would tell you that, right? So you've got to infer it from other, uh, other sources. Um, and the strategic, lastly, the strategic environment of the 2020s in the Indo-Pacific, and AUKUS in particular, I think has the ability to draw like-minded partners together, and that could include France, that could include the European Union, uh, and it, it probably will do. But it can also create tensions amongst them, and that AUKUS is the biggest expression of that kind of different, slightly different ways of seeing the world that operate amongst the English-speaking powers, at least the United States, Australia and, and the UK, uh, and France and the EU. Thank you very much. Thank you for indulging my, um, uh, you know, little intermission there. Um, but if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you. Thanks a lot. That was great. Um, questions, comments. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I might just repeat it. Um, so you talked about how diplomats think what they do as individuals like matter, and they just probably right having previously worked in the States, but um, what about being political leaders? So mm -hmm. the time that you're in the time frame that you're dealing with, you we've had Boris Johnson, we've had before that um Philip Ham uh, Philip Ham Hammond. Hammond and yes. had a chance mm -hmm. to uh, more recently they had obviously some difficult uh, people in that role, Dominic Raab who, mm -hmm. who wasn't well loved by the mm -hmm. officials. Now James Cleverly, who, mm. who seems to be um, viewed as much more interested. So how how much do you think individuals bring their put their own stamp on it and uh, rebrand, repackage, or want to be seen to be um, changing? Mm. I guess I'll just oh, yeah. summarize the question for the purpose of the tip, um, and cutting out a bit. For the purposes of the British High Commission not hearing some of that, maybe. <laughs> no. Um, so the question was about how much kind of individual political actors, individual mm. politicians, different foreign ministers coming in, for example, might kind of impact on this kind of outlook. Well, that, that, that's a great question, Paul. Thank you. And I mean, obviously, they different foreign ministers or or even prime ministers will have um, different capacities and agency to shape. The direction of um, the ministry or the polity or, or so on. Uh, and definitely different ministers bring different things to the role. But of course, it depends how much agency you've got, doesn't it? And agency is related to power. And the more power you've got, the more you can change things. And the, and the political power comes through a whole variety of sources, but also, you know, the, the, the kind of so-called mandate you might have in, in parliament. Um, I, I think that um, when we get to the, the Johnson phase of, of being foreign secretary, which you've got to remember, he was given that job for being a naughty boy, wasn't he? For like, and, and it was sort of put there where he could had to sort of work through the implications of his actions um, and be out of the country a lot. So we've seen, you know, we, we see uh, this it was the same when Kevin Rudd, if you remember, he went from being prime minister to foreign minister. And I'm very certain there was a lot of element of let, let's just get him out of the country and um so i i think a, around around johnson other brexiteers was a very strong uh desire to change things up so if, if we now think when johnson was in uh, as prime minister his advisor was dominic cummings and dominic cummings was someone who felt that one you know brexit was not an end in itself it was a means to change britain and 
And one of the ways to change Britain was to change the civil service. And, um, you know, the foreign common and off, uh, the, sorry, the FCO as it was then, was definitely in the firing line there as sort of seen be part of the blob. Um, so I, I, I think that um, this group of people, the, the RABs that you mentioned, you know, that they, they did a lot to change things. I mean, and obviously Brexit is a monument to that. That's, that's a huge strategic change. Um, and AUKUS is pretty um, important in that regard as well. So they can do something. I think the point I was making was a bit about the international relations theory would de-emphasize individuals as able to do something because, you know, the structures, the structures, man. And they, um, uh, uh, and I think that's what then jars with diplomats because diplomats work very hard and they do long hours and there's a lot of relational stuff, which is tiring. And, you know, sometimes your project works and sometimes it doesn't, it comes off. And so it it's that element of it. But yeah, you know, the structures are there, they do matter. So, um, uh, but that's a hard message to sell to a hard working diplomat. Thanks, Ben, that's a great presentation, really enjoyed it. I have two questions mm. um, with regard to um, you mentioned Labour, a, a Labour foreign policy in the future, a possible mm. Labour foreign policy. Um, David Lammy was an outspoken critic mm. and diehard opponent of Brexit. Yes. And I know the current leader of the Labour Party, Mr Starmer, has been very careful not to mention Brexit, but it's not going away in terms of its devastating impact on the economy, uh, which means that some at some point Labour may have to, or maybe some other future government, have to revisit the issue so i was just wondering uh, ha how you assess that situation mm. the brexit factor the elephant in the room that no british politicians want to talk about but it continues to have a devastating effect at least in the eyes of international observers on britain's standing and also its economic performance yeah my second question concerns AUKUS. Mm. um I'm very interested in your perceptions of AUKUS from australia because Australia seems to have been quite enthusiastic about AUKUS, but it's got huge cost implications for Australia. Paul Keating, a former prime minister, he's dismissed as a has-been, etc., and he's a lone voice at the moment. But he's raised some very disquieting issues. It's going to cost Australia between $268 billion and $368 billion Australian dollars, million, uh, billion dollars. Um, and they're not going to get their first submarines online to about 2030. Now, if China becomes mm. assertive, this, this is Keating scenario, if China becomes assertive between now and before New Zealand, uh, Australia gets its you know, nuclear submarines, that could create a crisis yeah. for AUKUS. I would just be interested in your, yeah. your take from an Australian perspective on AUKUS. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so, so two things, the Brexit and then AUKUS. So on, on Brexit, it's just... Uh, you're right, the Labour Party studiously avoids any mention of Brexit at all, because it's seen to divide its voter base between, uh, if you like, pro-EU pro tertiary educated city dwellers and its traditional base in smaller towns, working class. Um, uh, and that's the way that the vote was was interpreted. Um, uh, it does, Brexit does seem to be having a very negative effect on the UK economy. The I mean, the, the, the overblown claims um you know in the immediate aftermath of the uh of the vote detracted i think from the the the, the better analogy of a slowly deflating tire mm. um and that's probably where we are now because you know the the pandemic effect is no longer masking or muddying uh, some of the economic interpretations of the ef negative effects on the economy uh I suppose it isn't it isn't going away. I think that the stuff that I've read recently is that Brexit is having less of an effect on people's voting intentions, at least what they're telling, you know, than, than had because it distorted British voting patterns out of recognition, which is kind of why we got the turmoil that we did, so that politicians couldn't interpret what was going on on the ground and make successful judgments. You know, Theresa May's 2017 uh, election um seen as defeat I mean she actually won but you know it was uh, is the best example of that um but uh, the question often comes up i the other partner in this of course is the eu who would not want the uk back uh just because you know what would you be signing up for uh, <laughs> you know then there, then there'd be the possibility that you could change its mind again and you'd just be going back and forth like that so 
Um, I don't think it's kind of politically uh, on the table, but it's there as a kind of a, a, a sort of a, still an issue, but an identity around which certain progressive parts of the electorate can focus. And so, I, but but I think that the instincts of the Labour Party are just completely to not mention it at all. So there won't be any opportunity to bring that up. Um, on AUKUS, um, the, the Australian Labour Party has its conference going on at the moment. And uh, this is the first conference in government for um, 10 years. Uh, Paul Keating speaks for the left wing of the, the Labour Party, who are pretty quiescent about this. I've been surprised, but, um, and, you know, pr pretty surprised that that the Labour Party just sort of, you know, they, they were given apparently 24 hours notice that this was going to happen back in 2021. And then they sort of went along with it. And some of it was, again, that sort of tactical, uh, the idea was to um, create a, a security focused election, which Labour would be weaker on. And, and it all kind of like backfired when the um, Chinese uh, police force moved into the Solomon Islands. And um, that was during the election last year. And um, uh, it just made the Australian coalition government looked like it wasn't paying attention in the Pacific. But you're right, it's expensive. I mean, Keating's right, it's expensive. Um, there are a lot of questions. I don't think that uh, yet it's maybe settled into the public consciousness as, as much as we might think. Um, opinion is very focused on cost of living crisis, housing crisis. There are all other sort of domestic things that are crowding that that space and we know people don't really engage with foreign policy all that much unless something really kind of major happens as an election issue um but basically the, what, what keating has put out is are all valid questions and you know they um could leave australia strategically vulnerable till the first u.s submarines arrive we're going to borrow some u.s submarines i believe and then the british AUKUS ones come at 20 in 2040. Yeah. Thanks for that, Ben. Um, I just had a question just to turn things on its head a little. Um, I read earlier in the earlier in the year some um, interesting blanket coverage in the New Statesman about the, um, the resignation of um, Nicola Sturgeon as Scottish First Minister. And it, um, among the many things it covered was the whole sort of notion of the fragile structure of Great Britain or the mm. UK mm. itself. And, and you know, Sunak is, of course, been, has been battling that of late with Northern Ireland and of course Scotland is very pro pro Europe. Um, so, so, so I'm just wondering, um, you know, to what extent does you know you talked about the notion of global Britain being discarded, and I wonder, you know, how, how does the sort of fragile nature of the UK as an entity in itself sort of play into you know what you've addressed in your presentation? Mm. Thank you. And uh, just before I do that, I might, I might fact check the the dates of arrival of the you, the submarines. I may have got that incorrect so 20 yeah all right thank you so um on the nature of the united kingdom and i think that an important driver um the internal politics of uh nationhood and and, and territorial integrity are important in explaining brexit itself so the way i sort of think about it is that brexit was not just an instance of european disintegration it was actually a product of british disintegration too now, by disintegration, I don't mean complete you know, falling apart like Yugoslavia or so on, but I do mean that um, the the sense of of Br Britishness started to mean different things in different places. So, what it meant in Scotland was different to what it meant in in England to, to Northern Ireland and so on, right? Um, and uh, so, there was a strong sense until last year uh, that Scotland could be you know, looking at another independence referendum. We know they had one in 2014. Uh, it wasn't successful, but uh, strangely it energised support for independence and the Scottish National Party, which then became the third big biggest party in Westminster as dominating Scotland and so on. But I think uh, Sturgeon, and again, not quite sh sure that the political reasoning here may have been trying to play a medium game, but but she, she put up the idea that could, could Scotland unilaterally hold a referendum and that be binding and that went to the uk supreme court which said no it couldn't 
Uh, and that has had a, a, a very um, deflating effect on uh, the Scottish, let's call it the, the Scottish, the, the movement for independence in Scotland, which is not just the SNP, but also the Greens and so on. But it's mostly the SNP. And the problems that they've had at the top with the arrest of her husband, her resignation, you know, which was sort of compared to Jacinda Ardern's in, you know, this were, you know, two female leaders just saying, this is worth it, basically. Um, uh, or, or, they've, or they've done what they could do. I, I, th I think we won't necessarily see the effects of what's going on in the Scottish National Party until the next UK general election. Um, but that is another one of the elements that opens up the door a bit to the Labour Party, because it may be that the Labour Party is the beneficiary of the collapse of SNP support in Scotland. And without the Labour Party hasn't won an election in England for since 2001. So without those votes outside of England, particularly in Wales and, and Scotland, where its support collapsed, uh, it can't win elections. But also it starts to reintegrate the United Kingdom a little bit from where we were you know, 10, 10 years ago and, and, and less, because it was fragile, you're right. And I think that's an important dynamic in explaining Brexit and a lot about British politics. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation, Ben, I uh, really loved it. Um, you were talking about earlier about Kevin Rudd being pushed out of the country by being mm. foreign minister, and um, Albo appointed Kevin Rudd um, when he came into government as ambassador to the US, and you're saying um, if individual agency is hampered by structures of traditions and power, um, what are the implications of appointing a diplomat with much less hawkish opinions on China during the height of AUKUS to Washington? Mm. That's, yeah, that's that's a really good question. Um, the US is one of, uh, I think, five or six so-called political appointments that uh, Australia has. So y the US, the UK, Rome, not sure about New Zealand, actually, but, uh, but basically the, the, these um, chanceries go to political appointees. So they're usually people who've been high up in government. Um, at some at some point, but I, you, I hadn't considered fully, you know, the implications of this, and I wonder if that is sort of some some way trying to uh, trying to rein in maybe something to do, you know, the the or, or put a kind of slightly more pro-China voice in a significant post uh, such as Washington. But I think in in some senses, um, you know, if if AUKUS I don't, I don't think it's going to fall down, but there is a certain resistance to it in the United States. So the, the British Australian part is probably pretty solid. And, you know, the, the political economy of that is, is, is around manufacturing the submarines. Um, but uh, we don't know who's going to, to be in the White House or what the Congress is going to be like. Um, there could be a strong kind of Austra uh, America first sentiment um, that may, you know, that may wish uh, to not engage uh, with AUKUS to the extent that um, uh, the US have done so far. And I mean, and again, just talking to, to some of the people who talk to people who were there as part of the um, the interview process that we've done, there, there was this, this sense that, you know, B Biden sort of didn't entirely know what he was getting in for. He, he certainly didn't seem to know that the French would be so put out. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe this is some positioning by uh, the UK and Australia uh, to help get Australia out of a, a contract that they were struggling, struggling with. So, but it, uh, there's something I'll need to think about more. Thank you. That was a good question. Um, with re regard to China and Britain's foreign policy, do you think that as uh, if we have a potential Labour government, the being pro-China and anti-China can become the dividing foreign policy line in British politics, or is that uh, ship sailed in terms of uh, being firmly with the Americans, or if we begin to sort of side with the Europeans as Macron has 
begun to uh, talk as if he's going to uh, leave that, uh, leave the Americans mm. behind. I think if there was a Labour government, there would be less talk about, you know, there being some sort of Manichaean choice between Europe and the US. Um, and a Labour government would want to do do both. Uh, I think it was just a particular feature of the Conservative leadership, particularly in the wake of the Brexit referendum that was from this right wing of the Conservative Party that was very much pro-US, pro-Anglosphere um, and, and anti-European. And this goes back to you know the, the point about you know, what kind of accommodation might there, there be made. I think there'll be a lot of um, will on that side of politics to engage more with the EU. Um, but I think they won't be able to call it that. You know, it's it'll be and, and it'll be about things that sort of remain popular. it will be framed as a security issue about security vis-a-vis -vis Russia. I, I know that, that that China is one of those sort of issues that um, seems to travel around the, the, the right uh, of the, the three English speaking countries that we were discussing um, in or, or the related to AUKUS. And uh, it crops up. And I think that there's something similar that happens on the right of politics here. Uh, but I, d I don't know that for the United Kingdom, you know, China is still like a bit too far away somehow. And, you know, whilst it's quite, you know, present in, in people's calculations in Australia and New Zealand and the US in different ways, uh, it, it, I, I can't see that it's going to be the fault line. Um, but probably, if if anything, things will get more domestic. Some, you know, the fault line will be the culture wars stuff, which is seen to still make the socially conservative Labour supporters sort of want to support the Conservatives. But in the absence of Europe, I mean, in some senses, they're sort of victim of their own success. They haven't got anything to create that contingent alliance, that electoral alliance. Yeah, but I don't think it'd be China. It'd be a short answer. Mm. Mm. Uh, do you see do you think that um AUKUS is seen around the world as being driven by that anglosphere and um how do you think this could impact the agreement going into the future yeah that's also a really good question i think um can't you know m maybe we shouldn't underestimate you know how that gets perceived particularly maybe in southeast asia um you know, the, a country like Indonesia has got to have some concerns about nuclear powered submarines in one of its neighbors. And that sort of changes the equation a little bit. Um, and uh, of course, China's opposed to it. But but it, but it I mean, it, it, this kind of like shifts us a little bit into sort of post-colonial uh, understandings of international uh, relations, because, again, I think there is a way of of simply seeing these settler colonies. Well, you know, it doesn't include the United Kingdom, does it? But ba basically, what what's seen as white powers, um, uh, you know, with, with with colonial or imperial legacies, or or a legacy of of some of those colonial imperial moments, uh, acting in unison again, and and that has historical resonances. So I think that there there is a sense in which uh, it can be betrayed by that. I mean, I'm never, you know, to to, to see. The United States, uh, Australia, and US as as white powers doesn't do quite justice, but there is there is truth in that, and and I think that it can uh, the perceptions of that can raise some historical um, concerns, uh, particularly in the in the immediate neighbourhood of Southeast Asia. Uh, what do you think in light of, particularly in light of uh, recent comments by the by Minister Andrew Little and the recent security review, are the implications for New Zealand, particularly with the pillar two of AUKUS? Well, I, that's that's a good question. It's the kind of one I was hoping to get a bit of information on while I was here. So um, it, I I think that it it is worth pointing out that AUKUS isn't just submarines. I mean, the the submarines get our attention because they're big bits of materiel, right? So, but um, there's the there's the um, uh, 
uh, you know, the, the the artificial intelligence dimensions of this um, are also important, uh, but perhaps ways that are less visible to uh, the general public or even policy making elites. So I'm very interested to see how that pillar two will will develop, because then that that starts to bring in Canada also. Um, and then that kind of leads us to the Five Eyes Security Pact, which is when international relations scholars think about the Anglosphere is kind of the first thing they go to is the intelligence sharing that's been in place since the late 40s and early uh, 50s. Um, so uh, I don't have an exact answer for that because I'm still trying to understand the dimensions of that pillar too. Yeah. Um just getting back to the the issue of structure versus agency um and the the emergence of AUKUS, this global britain um anglosphere the rose by any other name whatever you want to call it are we seeing the establishment of the foundations of almost a new form of path dependence mm. in uk foreign policy going forward well the, thanks matt that's a, that's a good question i suppose it depends what the aberration was you know, it could be that the, the the European Union period was the aberration, and then we're sort of back to the norm, which is a um, country that does a lot of trade, um, uh, you know, has a, is a maritime power, um, has nuclear weapons, you know, that, those kind of things that would, would position the United Kingdom in a certain part of the international hierarchy, and from that hierarchy, we could say certain actions are like, more likely to flow than others. But I do... I do um, you know, th think that there was something, you know, notwithstanding what I've said about continuity, but there was something about like shifting back to that pattern that was quite radical. Um, and, you know, the implications of that are still, because things take a long time in international relations, don't they? I mean, e even like major shocks, the aftershocks take a, um, a little bit of time to manifest themselves. So we're still seeing that, but it, it's hard to, to, to get away from this notion that the, the ideas behind global Britain were rested on self uh, uh, overinflated perceptions of how important other countries thought Britain was. And, um, you know, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to score points there. I think, it, I think it's true that, uh, there was this kind of sense, and this is particularly true in the in the the U.S. free trade agreement, that somehow the U.S. would just want to do a free trade agreement, and um, uh, and that turned out not to be possible or the case, and we got a sort of something slightly less than that. So, so I think I think if that's where I feel that the miscalculation has, has come from. Um, the, the only thing is, and I, I don't really, I can't speak for New Zealand, but in Australia, it was true that there were lots of people reflecting back at Britain. Oh, wow, it's great that you're out now. Um, you know, we will do trade with you. And of course, that's terrific for Australia, but it doesn't replace the EU for um, the United Kingdom. So, you know, you can find those voices there. Um, but wh whether it's sort of path dependency uh, or, or not, um, I don't, I, I don't know. It could just be the logics of the of the system, but you can see people pushing against it. You know, the Johnsons and uh, and, and all the people around the Brexiteers. They were actually pushing against what they, um, and what what lots of people told them were just like this is simply the way it is, right? And you can't change it. And and there there I suppose you know then we can understand why they would kick back against something because nothing's impossible in politics, really, um, if you can set your mind to it. <clears throat> I also have a question. Um, I'm wondering about the Pacific Island countries and how they might relate to all of this, because a lot of them are English speaking and even former British colonies. But I don't think that's what people mean when they say the Anglosphere or Global Britain, yeah. which is particularly interesting when we think of AUKUS being in the Indo-Pacific region, where they all are. Yeah. And also the fact that things like AUKUS are kind of a, a breach of things like the Treaty of Rarotonga, mm. which where they agreed to be nuclear free, and also the Bikitawa Declaration, is, which is part of the Pacific Islands Forum, where <clears throat> member states agreed to consult each other on important security issues, which was not Australia didn't do. Mm. I mean, the Labour Party wasn't <laughs> yeah, no, even informed. informed. Yeah, that's a fantastic 
question and one just underscores the value of even just a short trip across the Tasman to get a new perspective because in all the stuff about Orcus and the and the Anglosphere uh, that I've read and heard of Pacific Island states have not been mentioned at all but you make a very good point is that some of them are English-speaking countries so normally the debate goes that there are there's basically a core Anglosphere which is five eyes but but really there's a kind of a core within a core which is the Orcus partners right so it's the manifestation of that and then there's stuff around the peripheral stuff which is like, well, is India part of the Anglosphere? You know, that, that's an official language. Singapore is usually cited as a great example of what Brexit has wanted Britain to become. And there is this whole narrative in Britain about being an island state and the kind of implications that has for, as we were just saying, for foreign policy. You know, the French and Germans couldn't possibly understand uh, why, why we do the things that we do because we're an island state. But never have I once heard the Pacific Islands mentioned in in that um so you know if you want to write a paper that's you know it's going begging but like you know so um uh i mean i don't have a specific answer uh, to that but i've i've never heard it come up in the australian debate uh, the way that that um the southwest pacific is presented in australia is a sort of source of strategic vulnerability that the previous government dropped the ball on and allowed china to encroach yeah thank you Thanks, Ben. I'll, I'll hand over to Jeffrey in a minute, but just to say thanks from myself. We've had a long day. <laughs> so um, Ben spoke to my nationalism paper in the morning about nationalism and European in integration, disintegration, from a drawing on nationalism theories uh, and European integration, disintegration theories. Uh, we had a two-hour session, including with Anton and others, in the afternoon. Uh, talking about um, Putin's idea of the nation and Ukrainian identity and so on. Uh, and and then something quite different. But what's really impressed me is the way that you kind of mix both the theory uh, and the uh, kind of empirical and kind of adjust it for the audience. Oh. So it's really good, I think, for an NZIAA talk here to have a more kind of empirical one, but still... Uh, at a lighter level still bringing in really interesting theoretical framework so thank you very much thank you for me now just yeah. Yes, I'd just underline that. Thank you very much, Ben. That was such an insightful presentation, covered so much ground, and we had a very lively Q&A session as well. So thank you to all of you for coming along to this event uh, and for participating uh, in, in with such great gusto. Let's uh, thank our speaker. Thank you, everyone, and I hope you get your, your Otago branch up and running. Yeah, thank you. New logo.